Hi, I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. Well, I hope everyone had a nice Thanksgiving. You know, there's so much strife, turbulence, and insanity going on in the world right now, but there's also so much to be thankful for. I found that it's sometimes difficult to focus on the small, everyday miracles that are ever present in my life, with all the noise and distraction of impending doom and real disasters. But it's far more rewarding. And sometimes, I don't know, we just need to feel good about life. And that brings me to my guest. I'm joined again by Diana Cooper, the Executive Director of Brookings Core Response, a great organization in town that works to connect people who need services with the services that they need. Hi, Diana, and welcome back to the show. Hey. <laughs> It's so good to see your face again. I know. It's. Uh, I mean, this is the one place I know I'm actually going to be I know. able to see you. And right? you actually had to like text me and call me and be like, you do remember you're coming, right? <laughs> and I was like, totally, I'm not laying in my pajamas. Yeah, but you bed. totally were. <laughs> I mean, I'm still in my pajamas, but I, you know, I'm here now. <laughs> good for you. Well, you know, an hour ago, I was rushing for the shower yeah. because, yeah, you know. Okay, same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's just one of those times. I know. When you have multiple days off. Off too. I always lose track of yeah. the days. Like when the kids, you know, remember when you were in school and you'd write the date on every paper? Yes. And then summer, you'd be like, I don't know what day it is. I Who know. cares what day it exactly. is? Exactly. And that's sort of how I feel on the weekends or if there's extra long weekends. Only I do care. And yeah. I'm constantly like, is it Sunday? I know. You know, I know. Panicking. Well, so. you, you also have to care because you I do. work I do. all the time. All I know. The time. And deadlines. Constant forever deadlines. I know. Someday I'm going to retire and just go pump gas, and that's really. Be amazing. Do you really think it's that's be fantastic? What, I, I can't even begin to tell you how wrong oh, you are. No. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it. You will never just be pumping gas. Oh, you just won't. But that would be the life. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't it? <laughs> Daydream all day. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's it's funny. We always start not quite knowing what we're going to talk about. <laughs> And one of us then says something about an idea, a concept, and thing that recently happened, and we're off and running. Diana mentioned moral injury to me, and I immediately thought about ethics. And somehow we got around to politics and what that actually is. So, I don't know, we're going to try and get around to all of that, <laughs> although we only have, you know, 58 minutes, so I'm not it's just really a couple sure. of topics. Not <laughs> exactly. We definitely won't elaborate. Small topics, very small topics, yeah. So, let's start first with what's new in the world of Correspondence. Yeah, so we have been, I'm like, there's so much going on that sometimes I'm like, where do I even start? But um, <laughs> we are, we just hired on... Um, one new staff person, and then we have hopefully another staff person starting this week. So that'll that'll bring us to eight staff, no which is way. crazy. Eight? And like gives me a little anxiety <laughs> <laughs> to know. I know there are there are like businesses and companies with you know five hundred thousand employees. That's just absolutely insane to think mm, about being responsible yeah. for that many people. Yeah, um, I'm not even sure how you can think about that many people. So. So I've um, met Dave and I've yep, met Dave, Steve, Steve and Isabel and I've met Isabel um, and then and I, I've now met, met Kathleen. Kathleen, right? So who else do you have? So I don't know if you've met Laura yet. Mm. Laura was a, a longtime volunteer, and mm -hmm. then um, actually I think she was volunteer for close to ten months. Wow! And then she eventually applied for a position, and we had so many good candidates. It was really hard. Um, and everybody was pretty much equally, yeah, everybody was equally qualified. So we ended up um, hiring Laura. And then we now have Liz, who's going to be managing the shelter and then turnkey and all of that. Wow. Um, which she's done that over in Medford. She used to work at Rogue Retreat. So that's Great. really awesome. I know. Great. Um, and I've known her for a while. And even though we haven't worked super close together, I've watched her um, do a lot at Rogue Retreat. So I was really excited when she reached out. Um, so that brings us to seven, and then we have we're hiring another peer, which will work under Liz to kind of help support the shelter and great. eventually move over to um, the transitional housing at Turnkey. So great. Um, so yeah. it sounds like the shelter's like imminent. Yeah, we're due to open. Um, we actually do have one person in right now, just because there was such a critical need. 
but we are going to be open to applications on Monday. So, and the shelter is the place in. Gold Beach. No, that oh, is. Oh my goodness! I I'm so confused. <laughs> I keep saying I keep, we're using um, part. We rented out part of a motel, and so I keep saying the motel, and then um, everybody at my work keeps saying you have to stop saying the motel because we're purchasing the motel in Gold Beach. <laughs> and so, ah, so um, yeah, no, the shelter is yeah. down here in Brookings. Um, okay. I know that us and the coalition got some funds for shelter. Great. I know Beth's working on figuring, we're, we're both working on getting it up and running as soon as possible. But Excellent. we had, it wasn't even that we were slowed down. We had totally put on the brakes and abandoned the car completely for shelter because we were told we would not have a shelter this year or this No funding, yeah, right? There was yeah, we, we were told yeah. there's no funding. And so we both turned our backs and started, we're like, okay, what else can we work on? So we're we're trying to not drop any balls right now and get oh. this going. Um, I'm <laughs> sure she's face. yeah. I know, right? That's just like the state yeah. too. Sometimes I, I appreciate know. it though, but um, yep. a little warning would have been nice. <laughs> so, uh, so we're working on getting that open right. by by the end of the week. Actually, excellent. Um, That's great. Yeah. So we'll have eight staff. We'll have. Um, the shelter open, we're looking, and that's just until the end of March. So mm -hmm. that's a winter shelter. They don't right. run longer than that usually. Right. Sometimes through June if we get a cold spell. Mm -hmm. um, I yeah. hope we don't get another cold spell. I hope not too. That's pretty rare here. And yeah. most people aren't prepared for that no. to happen. And so that's why it's such a crisis. And people are prepared for the wet and the cold, even though yeah. it's miserable and awful. And Right. But um, snow... When you're out there. But the Not snow, so yeah, and yeah. especially when it's windy and snow yeah. or or below freezing, yeah. because it's just people aren't prepared. They're they're traveling fairly light, and every once in a while we get where it kind of starts warming up in the spring, and then we get a cold snap, and mm. it just everybody's already started shedding their oh, yeah. extra layers. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so hopefully no crazy surprise weather this year and okay. maybe maybe be able to get some transitional housing and maybe even a year-round shelter eventually oh. uh, before we get another God, you know, that would be storm. so good yeah it's it's uh you know there's a lot of work being done it just takes a long time of course but um, they're big projects they are yeah and it takes a lot of people mm -hmm. so um mm -hmm. sometimes i'm working and i can't figure it out and it's just not time yet somebody else yep. has to come along so, so we've got that going. We also, I met with, this is a really exciting piece. I met with a provider yesterday, like a, basically a, um, I think family nurse practitioner. And mm -hmm. I really hope that's right. Cause I can't remember her initial or, you know, the alphabet after yes. the name. <laughs> uh, I barely remember my own. Um, I know. <laughs> so, but she's great. She's lovely. And I think it was her, um, maybe her sister, her partner in it all, um, I met them yesterday. We'd kind of been having a conversation for the last couple of weeks and we did a Zoom. Um, this is from a different area and she's going to um, basically offer telehealth um, medicine through our office wow. so that we'll be able to connect people directly to a provider and not make them wait. And it'll be very specific to the folks that we're working with who, you know, generally either can't wait uh -huh. or, um, you know, they they wait so long and then if they don't have access to transportation or they don't have a phone so they don't know what time it is, yep. they miss one appointment, they have to wait months and months more. So they just kind of, I mean, that's, I remember doing that up until probably I went to treatment. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up here. So if I couldn't see my provider or if they rescheduled or if something happened, if I missed it, because I didn't have transportation either, mm -hmm. um, I just didn't reschedule it again because, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes even now I want to not reschedule. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I get it. Um, so, and mm -hmm. that's really what keeps people from staying on these helpful medications that keep them out of the hospital and keep them from declining on the street. And um, I know a lot of folks think that some of the kind of um, stuff that they're seeing out there really is only as a result of drugs, but we also have a lack of mental health medication here. Um, Significant lack. Yes. And even in the country, there's a shortage of certain medications. And so it can be very difficult to get. Uh, mm. And it's, you know, it's a controlled substance in most, most are, mm -hmm. um, not like depression meds usually and things like that, but you know, for the more severe um, and persistent mental illness, those mm. meds are usually are controlled. Um, oh, interesting. And so it's difficult to get and you can't, you know, I know because, you know, my family, there are people in my family who take these meds, in fact, in my home. 
And so when you get your prescription, which usually your primary care won't write, they want, they want you to go see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. psychiatrist. Yeah, yeah, psychiatrist. Yeah. So um, it's, they can write them, but they prefer not to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they really want you to see a psychiatrist. But, but if you get into a provider that will write it, whether it's a psychiatrist or not, and you get your meds, you can only ask for the refill on, I think it's the, actually the day you run out. Wow. So potentially you're going in the next day to pick them up and that's the day that you would be out. So you're right. hopefully no gap. But, you know, in, in our house, um, you know, someone in my family takes these pretty controlled substance medications mm-hmm. and has went even up to as, as far as two weeks without because mm-hmm. of shortages and um, and providers around here, you know, I think there was one provider that went away that was prescribing. And so it took months to find a new provider. And in that time, I think the primary care was writing prescription. But, you know, sometimes they miss the refill or mm-hmm. the the pharmacy is out. So all that to say, it's really difficult to get these meds as it is just mm-hmm. as a person. I mean, even as us, like I, yep. I navigate these systems yep. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So we know there's a significant shortage for people who are out there and um, a lack of access. So this provider will be able to um, do medications for oh, mental great. health, but also, um, you know, she's really looking to expand some of our addiction access too. So um, there are certain injectables and medications that um, that are non-narcotic that people can get to get out of, you know, whether it's alcohol, whether it's fentanyl, whether it's um, meth. It'll help them bring them out of it. And so she'd like to start prescribing and being able to provide access to those meds for people. Wow. So we could see even more um, access to addiction medicine here just through various means, not just this provider. But I think I think there's an effort going on to see this happen in most um, most like nonprofits Mm -hmm. around here, social Mm -hmm. service agencies. Mm -hmm. I think are willing to take on, you know, the church has a provider oh, um, that helps see people. So right. we're all finding ways to well, seriously, if we can positively affect right. the the mental health around this yeah. place, we're all going to. We be need happier. everything we can get. Yeah, for that. Yeah, no, exactly. Every possible thing we can get. I mean, even pain medication. Mm-hmm. You know, my my husband is on pain medication because he's disabled and he's in pain. There there have been times when we can't get it yeah. because the pharmacies are out. It's yeah. like, excuse me? I know. It's very strange. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Um, I actually have a hesitation to taking a lot of medication mm-hmm. too because, and somewhere in the back, just because I have a, an aversion to taking meds, but even in the back of my head, I'm like, if there's a, a zombie apocalypse, I don't want to be withdrawing <laughs> from something, you know? <laughs> Um, I just like that in my head. The apocalypse <laughs> coming right up, right? <laughs> Although these days, you never know. I know, know. Um, how far away are we? Actually, the next news headline. I know. So I, yeah, th- so that's that's a lot. And then we kind of um, we also have we're right now we're looking for some volunteers for the front end. So mm-hmm. we have our walk-in services, right? That are pretty bustling right now. We, I actually was telling everybody, well, usually in the winter, it slows down, you know, oh. things. It does. It typically does. Okay. Because people are kind of like, they find somewhere where they're going to be. Hunker down. Yeah. From, yeah. you know, weeks on end or right. at least a week because it's too wet to yeah. do much. So, um, but, but we're, we're having beautiful weather. We are. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're having a lot of sun, but it's still cold. Yeah, it is. Um, it is. And it's really cold at night. Mm-hmm. And I don't do well with that as it is. But mm-hmm. yeah, for people out there, it is. But um, yeah, so we're we're looking for some volunteers because our our numbers have not really went down. Mm-hmm. And um, starting the shelter and starting some other programs, like I think we thought, okay, one great space for people. Um, we have a lot of people who reach out who want to come volunteer and want to come help. But we've kind of been growing a lot, and so I haven't really known where to put someone <laughs> um, because things are changing. But yeah. now we've gotten to a point where um, I think that this is a really good spot for someone, um, either whether it's the walk-in services and like handing out bags, you know, helping them with clothing, um, helping them charge phones, just things like that. Great. Or the shelter, helping mm-hmm. people get, well, we're probably not going to have them um, transport clients because that's something we do. But 
transporting food or supplies or things like that or, um, yeah, picking up food. Excellent. So that's Excellent. one one opportunity we have for people right now. And I know a lot of people have been emailing and asking. Mm-hmm. So Great. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And so we've we've got the shelter starting hopefully by the end of this week. Yep. And any, no pressure. <laughs> uh, no, no pressure. Uh, any other things that, any other surprise grants? Uh, no, not right now. <laughs> I'm like kind of, you know, there's, I don't think any outstanding grants right now that I'm unaware of. But there was, a, yeah, there was like a surprise grant that came through that I didn't even apply for. So that was very nice. So, um, which is all stuff we're working on for turnkey and the transitional housing. Great. So that's going to be a, that's going to be a project for a minute. Oh, that's going to be huge. Yeah. It's I know we went huge. and looked at it, um, well with that provider, cause mm-hmm. there's a few medical respite rooms. So we went and looked at it yesterday and just every time I walk through, I'm just thinking we could do this and yep. we'll put this over here. Yep. And, um, but there's a lot of work. So. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Of course. Of course. So, um. Let's start with moral injury, because that's where that that's kind of where we first, yeah, you know. And we've talked about it a, a tiny bit before, but I. So how are we defining? Well, there's, I mean, there's a lot of ways to. You, there's some probably some textbook answer ways to define moral injury, but essentially, it's our uh, the experience that we're going through in the moment fighting with our humanity and and our morals and ethics. And so um, like something I did or something I didn't do caused injury or um, somehow I was a part of this harm that's happening. And there's, I, I know, so I teach sometimes at the um, Rogue Community College, I teach just one little education module every um, spring and then every winter for the incoming community health worker students. Mm-hmm. And I we, I just did the moral injury one and the feedback that, I mean, everybody had a good example of a type of moral injury that they had seen or experienced. And it was really, um, I mean, it's so broad. I think everybody um, experiences some kind of moral injury at some point in time. And I would wager to say, especially now that we've been through an entire like global pandemic and the political. So give me some rest. examples. So uh, one example would be. Um, one that's called resource allocation. So that is, you know, you have five tents and you have seven people coming in. Oh. And so and they all need a and tent. And they all need a tent. Let's say they're all over the age of 80 even. Um, or, you know, just just not having enough. Yeah, here's an example that I think um, we heard about a lot during, you know, probably April to June 2020 was um, not enough ventilators. Yep. And... I had the experience of meeting with the doctor that was at ground zero in New York City at the hospital, who was the one determining who lives and who dies Mm. during, you know, April of 2020 and um, probably into May. I I can't remember Mm -hmm. exactly when we met. And I mean, talk about moral injury. You're you're the one deciding. So our ethics, especially if you're a doctor, it's do Mm -hmm. no harm. You know, the the moral code is to do no harm. And so you're going to work that day knowing that you're picking out people to die. Mm. And so that in and of itself is a significant moral injury and even, you know, a moral trauma, I'm sure, because a lot of us didn't even have that experience and we still have our own trauma Mm -hmm. from, you know, what we saw and what happened during the pandemic. So, and I say that as though it's over, which we know things are still going on. It's always in flux, but. Right. But definitely it's ground zero. Mm-hmm. There's significantly less yes. trauma. It was all at once. It was new to people. It and I'm huge. sure, you know, providers like that in the hospitals, they expect that, okay, there may be mass casualty events where I have to make these decisions, but it went on and on and on for months and yeah. um, at least weeks for those providers. And then in it New felt York. like it was going to get better and then Delta hit. Yeah. So, it, and, and it, that's that's another thing too. All over again. Is um, you know the moral injury we can sort of compartmentalize for a period of time, mm-hmm. but after a while we really have to process that. And we have to deal with it, and it can come out in a lot of ways. So one of the um, one of the interesting conversations that we had in that class was about law enforcement and how 
law enforcement, not just how they interact with, you know, people and how that causes moral injury for them, but also how they are sort of conditioned to deal with it. And I'm not going to say everyone, because there's certainly been officers that I've known who, um, they always stay soft to it. You know, they always stay, um, I want to say like open to, um, the understanding that people are suffering. And, but that is one job where you really do, it's critical that you get in there and you do your job the way you're trained to do, and then you get out. And so we see officers who especially are dealing with people who are out on the street and they know they don't have a resource for it. And so they can handle it in different ways. They can, um, you know, one, they can push back to their supervisors, to the leadership in the city and say, you know, we really need to stock tents. We really need to um, have these resources available. We we need to speak up and speak out when services are expanding. Um, and, you know, those officers also may reach out to resources and really push to try to get support for someone. In a community like ours, it does, I mean, it, it's pretty difficult because there isn't a lot of resources here. And so if you have someone in their 80s, you know, with dementia out on the street, and you're an officer and you're getting called because there's this person on the street and it's concerning as it should be, but you don't have anything you can actually do. Um, that's sort of the resource allocation and the scarcity of resources. That and it would be very money. frustrating if you were the that officer. It is because you're constantly getting called to deal with it. Right. And you know that it's actually not you right. um, that should you, be dealing with it. And you have it. nothing to give. Yeah. And so... Sometimes what we see, and often this is what we see in community members, people, just everyday people, because it, it, one person cannot solve these problems. And, and so I want to say to people who get frustrated because, um, you know, well, again, they take the frustration and, and it kind of is, they kind of harden themselves mm -hmm. to the situation. And instead of looking at the problem, they're looking at the person as the problem. Um, and yes, people do can cause problems, but the issue we're seeing here is that there's homelessness and it's um, widespread and there's really not good solutions right now. So, And it's a lack of resources. It's a lack of resources. Because if, if there were, for instance, if there were a large shelter here in Brookings, then we would not have people on the street. There may be a couple or a there few. There would definitely still right? be people on the yes. street um, and it would always fluctuate. Right. But... Um, we would have a cushion. Yes. And so there would be less moral injury on the providers and the um, police officers and all right. of that. But but an interesting thing would happen in that they would, they would suddenly, um, because if there was a shelter like that and you figure, okay, an officer or a, an agency has someone in their lobby that's desperately in, um, they would work really hard to get them into that shelter. But they may not do that for just any other person that comes in. Mm. So they would start without even knowing it. They would start being the resource allocator. Wow. And so, and that's what we, it, it's pretty natural mm -hmm. for us to do that. I, I do that in my work all the time. Mm -hmm. We have to, because we don't have enough resources. Right. Um, and so you don't even know you're doing it. Mm. And it's not necessarily that that's a bad thing. It's just that everybody needs help. Mm -hmm. But when we don't have enough, we start picking and choosing who's worth it. And when there's nothing at all, we decide everybody is the fault. Their it's homelessness their is fault. the fault of their yeah. own. Yeah. And everybody is the cause of their own homelessness because we can't deal with it, because right. we can't fix it. And right. so when we say, well, I can't fix that, um, it's just easier to see them as the problem. And that's mm. not, you know, that's just, we do that with all kinds of things. Right. And so it's easier to push them away. Um, and so that actually is one pretty typical response people have to moral injury. And my response to that is you can acknowledge that you're not the person to fix it and also still be open to the fact that that's a human being and they need actual help. And they're hurting. And yeah. it sucks to stand there and be like, I recognize you're hurting and I recognize you need help and I can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. It does suck. Mm -hmm. But it's better than treating them like crap essentially yeah. because you know well they're the problem and even if that's true there's nothing that, that that's not going to do anything as it is so that's what moral injury can really cause for people mm -hmm. um and that's just talking about homelessness we you know we see it 
We see it in war. We see it, I mean... Yeah, think people of, are, I mean, mm-hmm. normal, everyday people suddenly are part of a military that right. literally has to kill people. Yeah, That's think of the, the Holocaust, point. you know? And yes. It's, so it's, um, it's really like our morals and our ethics tell us that this is good and this is right. And um, we kind of saw a little bit about this at the uh, town hall for Turnkey. Um, there were people saying, well, vets have resources, vets have um, places to go and, you know, just sort of talking about resources that aren't actually there. Mm-hmm. Even still on Facebook, I've seen a few times people say, um, you know, oh, there's resources for vets. And I'll say, well, they're, as far as like getting them into, sh- you know, homeless vets, there's resources. And I'll say, well, there's not because there's no shelter. And then they'll come back with, oh, you know, the um, coalition or, oh, St. Timothy's or, oh, whatever. They help with vets. So, yes, there is. We all know what those resources are. And so there, there's not. Um, but when people are, I guess when people are talking about these resources, it's their way of kind of not recognizing or not um, digesting the fact that there isn't right. a resource because right. that would cause moral injury for them. Because the, the resource, I mean, it, it it's interesting to decide that the resource is um, St. Timothy's, for instance. But but that's not actually the resource. That is the, the portal connection to. into the resource. Yes. And the same resource with, is the house that, right. you know. Same yeah. with the coalition, same with us, same mm-hmm. with Orca. So when they say, oh, no, 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 so-and-so, they, they help vets. Mm-hmm. They help them the same way we do. Right. And so that's not what we're talking about here. To what we're talking about. To the extent about, that there are actual yeah. resources. Right. Yeah. So, and that's just, resource allocation is just one example of sort of a moral dilemma that causes moral injury. There's um, ethical conflict, conflicts. So when, you know, when we have clients who are engaging in like really risky behaviors, um, you know, maybe they're using substances or they're self-harm. And so how do we balance, especially using substances? So if we have an individual who's using substances, who is working a job, gets up every morning, takes a shower, brushes their teeth. Um, you know, keeps their house relatively tidied, um, but they're using meth or something like that. So how do we decide what's best for them, even when we see that maybe some of their physical health is declining? And so we're really trying to like balance autonomy Mm -hmm. with the, the experience that we're having with them, what we're seeing with them. So that's another kind of moral injury. Mm -hmm. Um, Although I'm, I I do fairly well with that one because I have used it before. And so I recognize um, what it takes to to get clean sometimes is really just somebody not stopping us necessarily or forcing us, but um, just kind of being there with us while we're while we're taking care of other bad habits. Mm -hmm. And then we eventually get to that one. Mm -hmm. So. But if a person is not in the space to to actually stop. You can't force it because they'll I mean, just relapse. There's ways, I suppose, you could. I was, while I wasn't necessarily forced, you know, they didn't take me in handcuffs or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, they certainly did hold my kids over my head mm-hmm. and they did pick us up in cars and drop us off at, you know, a treatment mm-hmm. center. So um, it kind of forced, certainly mm-hmm. felt that way. Mm-hmm. And and we were in there long enough and we had enough support around us to to make it. But in the absence of all of that support, it was a lot. I mean, we had multiple agencies involved in our family um, for over a year. I want to say there was probably close to six agencies directly involved on a weekly basis wow. with us. Wow. So um, outside of that, you know, forcing someone really can result in multiple and every relapse usually tends to cause more trauma for the person. Um, so especially when they weren't ready to get clean in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, yep. Um, and, and it can push them away. So that's like kind of another one. There's a lot and I, I won't go through them all because there's too many, but mm-hmm. um, you know, there's also like client safety, which this is the one that I think police most often deal with is, Someone, like I said, someone who's, you know, in their 70s, 80s, even 90s Mm -hmm. out on the street Mm -hmm. um, and they have nothing to offer this person. So 
It must be so frustrating. I, oh, I, mean, I, I just, yeah. you know, to be in that We position. see it all the time. Yeah. I mean, we talk to some of these officers and um, even sometimes they get a little bit gruff with us. Mm -hmm. And I know it's not because they're mad at us. Mm -hmm. It's because they're, they're like, why should I be dealing with this? And you're right. Yes. You shouldn't be dealing with it. Right. Right. Um, but you you can notice you can recognize that yes you have nothing to offer them and also they're not bad people like right. Right. you can recognize both of those things and right. I really wish more um, law enforcement would recognize that because there's no you know there's no need for that stigma it doesn't and, do any good and I looked up um, I was googling stuff because of course as soon as I knew what we were going to talk yeah. about it was like oh I got to find out about this and. And of course, one thing takes you down. Oh, you should have just you know. went to my class. It <laughs> yeah, really. And so it's like, you know, kind of down the rabbit holes. But um, I came across something that said, well, is, is moral injury a, um, a mental health issue? And is it different from PTSD or is it the same? Mm -hmm. And what I found was that uh, this one answer was that it, the the people who are experiencing moral injury may not fit the criteria for PTSD or another mental illness. Instead, they're suffering from a severe disconnect between the moral principles they live by mm -hmm. and the reality of what is happening or has happened. Yeah. And that would be, wow, the disconnect is what yeah. And it's so interesting because the division that we see right now in our country, specifically the political division, is really rooted deep in moral injury. It's just an another thing about moral injury is it does not have to be real harm. It can be perceived ah, harm. So if a person so thinks that the election was stolen and really believes that, you can imagine. That's what more, kind of yeah. distress they are have right. been in for the last few years. Right. Whether we believe it or not, right. they're in real distress. Yeah. And so um, it really is a division of what they know to be right, whether it is or not, mm -hmm. and what they perceive is actually happening. Wow. And so... Boy, I don't even know how you begin to get through yeah. that. I mean, um, that's... Wow. That's actually kind of one of the reasons why, because it causes so much psychological distress mm -hmm. that if it's something is, is, you know, if it's something as granular as, um, you know, just some difference to some social difference or just some, you know, difference of opinion, probably not as big of a deal. But if we're talking about forced vaccinations, which is what that's what a lot of people think is, is mm -hmm. going on. Um, if we talk about, you know, stolen elections, which again, a lot of people think is going on. These are global. These are national. These are big. and Huge. And so, you know, if there was a genocide happening, um, you would, especially on a, on a national level, and you, I mean, we would all be going a little bit crazy mm -hmm. trying to stop it, trying to get things to, to turn around. And if we knew that there was no way to get them to turn around, I think it would break something inside of us. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that everybody can recover from things like that. And so there is actually a real trauma that's happening with a lot of people who have, in in my opinion, have heard a lot of things that are not actually true. A lot of mis misrepresentation of what's been going on in our country. And I think no matter what side you're on, it's been traumatic. But for those who are on the other end of what is actually happening in the world right now who believe differently, they're probably experiencing a different type of PTSD that is going to stay with them for a long time. Yeah. And um, it's and it's deep. It I is. Mean, it's, and it's just not And it's one of the more dangerous parts of um having this global communication and social media is that um there's real trauma happening to a lot of people because of lies mm -hmm. so yeah um wow wow and when you so when you think about that because i'm i'm always looking for trying to understand somebody or trying mm -hmm. to understand their perspective or un understand why they are reacting the way they're reacting i mean that it it makes sense right oh, if, totally if what you are if the news source that you are 
listening to and that you absolutely believe is giving you the truth yeah. is giving you something other than what your next door neighbor is getting how do you even how yeah. do you even make sense of that i mean okay so do you remember a couple weeks ago well i know you remember this but remember a few weeks ago we were at the city council meeting watching the um vote like watching the vote happen to to bring in a new counselor and watching all of these things happen that we were not expecting to be happening because we had thought well it's going to go this way um Although we hypothesized there was a chance it could go that way. And so remember sitting there when it was all happening and I watched you because you're in front of me and just the amount of movement in your seat during all of that happening was and knowing there's nothing you could do about it. You have to just sit there and watch and let that happen. Um, and so that is how. An entire and and then if you were to go to somebody you know one of your friends and be like can you imagine you know can you believe that happened and for them to say like I don't know what you're talking about right that was okay yeah, yeah. or like I yeah, yeah. it was fine yeah. you know you go crazy yeah um and so <laughs> but 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 <laughs> yeah so everybody that is um you know following news that is misconstruing what's really happening is going. A little crazy because their neighbors are like, no, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. And they are in a panic um, oftentimes over these things. And so, and I've been there. I totally understand mm -hmm. that. I mean, I've watched our, even our county commissioner meetings, um, although I haven't watched many over the last year or so, but, you know, sometimes I would be watching a county commissioner meeting, just like listening to them talk about things. They have no idea what they're talking about. No. And making decisions on those things that they have no idea. And based so, on mm -hmm, Based on what they just said yes. that they heard from some yes. uncle somewhere. Yes. And and so I'm like literally panicking yeah. at home. Yeah. And there's nothing I can do. No. It's a terrible feeling. It really is. Um, <laughs> and that's that's quite a bit of moral injury. And certainly um, it, it's one that's really, really obvious right now right. in our nation. and. It's happening about, you know, the war over in Israel, too. Like, yes. people are losing their minds. Yes. Um, and, and there's lives at stake, but we're not the ones calling the shots. And so I really do think people need to take it down a notch for a minute. And, like, your opinion of what is going on in the world is not actually going to affect the way this war is turning out. Unless you're the president of the United States or right. some right. general somewhere. I mean, you do have to kind of look at your, what your sphere of influence is. Yes. And, yeah. you know, most of us have a fairly small sphere. And it's also, the moral injury is actually also, the, the trauma that comes from moral injury is also actually what is causing the division in the country. Because what do you do to, you know, um, abate that, to to get that to go away is you stop, you, you don't go around people who believe the opposite because it makes you feel insane. Right. Whether that's healthy or not right now, that yeah. is what people are doing. And so they're kind of keeping to their own side and they're yes. kind of, that, that's what causes a lot of division. And so. And actually it exacerbates it. It so, is self-preservation to a certain yeah, extent. But yeah. I think that if you're not, um, when once you're in a better state, if you're not processing through that, you're going to run into a lot of issues and mm -hmm. it causes resentments and it causes all kinds of. Issues, oh, yeah. The trauma, yeah. you know. And I mean, it, in families. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was talking to somebody the other day whose family member is, you know, just completely opposite. And mm -hmm. it's like, they don't really talk to each other. Yeah. Like, okay. That's no, because bad. why, you know, why would you if yeah. if this person is so, uh, is speaking or appears to be speaking so polar opposite to your own right. moral ethic and yeah. what you think the world should be operating on. Yeah. And it's... It's interesting how our moral ethics um, got so skewed um, between one person to the next. Yeah. It's so different from one person to the next. So how are ethics different for, from morality? Because that, to me, was a very interesting yeah. point. Ethics is a little bit like the precursor to moral injury. It's sort of like, okay, what is right and wrong? Mm -hmm. It's... Um, like, you know, kind of the principles that guide us. And so moral injury is when we're seeing something that goes against what society has mm -hmm. taught us is correct and 
And right. And I would think that that ethics is something that um, is kind of a community based thing. Like a community comes up with ethical codes, they decide kind ethics. Of. Morality is your own personal, the way you were raised or what you, you yes. believe in kind of to your core. It's, it is it is a little bit like that. And ethics, um, because ethics is sort of like the integrity of, you know, society. Mm-hmm. And so it's how, you know, what we've decided, all of those principles and what we've decided, um, sometimes it can be individual, but I think morality is really our interpretation mm-hmm. of society's mm-hmm. ethics. And mm-hmm. so... Be- and that's probably why it's so skewed from one person to the next. Ethics is a little bit easier for us to fall back on as a society. But well, there um, are actual, you know, if if you look at codes of ethics, right? Yeah. I mean, there there are actually like kind of rules, yeah. right? <laughs> this is the first the first code of ethics is this. The second one is this, right? So I mean, you've got yeah, we actually a framework. we actually have because um, we are all you know traditional health workers. And so we actually have a code of ethics, a community health worker code of ethics mm-hmm. on our website that mm-hmm. we um, pretty much live by. Right. Uh, and so every profession tends to have a code of ethics. You have a code of code of ethics for social workers, and mm-hmm. and it spells out. Um, it's not the scope. The scope is, you know, what am I allowed to do? What? How far can I take this care? And that's defined by your training. But the ethics is. Um, these are, this is, so the, your, your, your license and your certification is what, um, sort of what work you're allowed to do. Mm-hmm. The ethics is sort of like what moral actions you're allowed to take. And so, um, it's supposed to guide you individually, um, so that it's cohesive amongst all the people of that profession. You know, doctors have a code of ethics. Right. Which right. Is, Initially, do no harm. Yeah, exactly. And and really, most professions have a code of ethics. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's especially if it if it means interacting with the public, there are yeah. there are definitely and even more specifically, if it means interacting with um, people who are in a protected class or mm-hmm. vulnerable individuals. Mm-hmm. There's usually a um, more I don't know a more prioritized code of ethics because it's. It's like um, held at a higher value. So if you're a doctor or if you're a social worker or if you're um, someone who works with um, people with developmental disabilities, there's usually a pretty high code of ethics for that because Mm -hmm. we're talking about people who can't defend themselves or um, although some some can, but um, they can't actually defend themselves or speak out for themselves most of the time. So, yeah, there's kind of like a code of ethics for all professions. Right. Exactly. And that is not necessarily the same as an individual's moral code. It's not. It's and it's not. also yeah. not the same as the law. <laughs> ah. Yeah. So ethics yes. don't really have a lot to do with legality. Um, you can act completely unethically and still be within the law. And you can break the law mm-hmm. and be ethical. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So we have a very, uh, yeah. we have a very interesting, um, hum- humans are very interesting in just how we operate in general. We um, are interesting, yeah. yes. <laughs> Sometimes I shake my head and think, mm, this yeah. species doesn't have a chance. No, I know. <laughs> I know. And it's so like, well, then why do we, you know, why would we have a law if it's unethical to right. follow it and right. all that? And I think there's, of course, I don't have the answers to questions that big, but um, I think there is a spectrum of right and wrong. Well, there is a spectrum mm-hmm. of right and wrong. And it's so funny when I took I took some ethics courses, mm-hmm. and um, the first course I took was uh, ethics for counselors, and I was super excited to go into this class. And I was like, oh, I'm just so I'm a very ethical person, and I I know exactly what's right and wrong. It's very black or white for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got in there, and he the, I just remember the first class. He was like, uh, and like I actually thought that in my head. I thought, okay, I know what's black and what's white. I know what's right mm-hmm. and what's wrong. And then I got in there, and he said, we're gonna learn to live in the gray area. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't even know what that, that is. That did freak me out. Yeah. <laughs> so there was a lot of um. And it's for social workers, so they're assuming that you're going to be dealing with families, with mm-hmm. kids, and um, 
reporting and things like that, or el- people who are vulnerable, like, you know, seniors and people with disabilities. So there's a lot of scenarios they had us read through and really decide, okay, do we report or not report? Which that's one of the worst, Ooh, um, yeah. you know, do you report to DHS or mm-hmm. Adult Protective Services or something? Mm-hmm. And I remember getting the first sheet that had like eight on it, eight scenarios. And I was so, I read each one and I just thought at the end, I don't know about any of these. Mm. And some I thought for sure I would report on this. So I, I went to, I had the um, pleasure of sitting next to the behavioral health uh, supervisor at All Care at the time I was in school. And I was like, hey, can I sit with you and ask you some of these? And so he said, well, I won't tell you the answers, but I'd like to see your opinion on it. And so I remember reading one that said, you know, you're, you have, your client is in the office and she's a mom. She's been drinking and she has a four-year-old um, at home. And she's talking to you last night about how she blacked out drunk and the four-year-old was alone for several hours. Do you report or not report? And I thought, well, God, yeah, you're leaving a four-year-old alone. Well, of course you would report. And he was like, well, I don't know. She's in your office right now, though. She's telling you all this. There might be an opportunity. Like the child is safe Mm -hmm. right now. There might be an opportunity here. Mm -hmm. And I was like, so don't report. And he's like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I just... I warred with some of them for forever. Yeah. Um, and so those are examples of like, you know, having to make those calls based on ethics, but having to interpret those ethics through your own moral code. Mm-hmm. Um, and none of those are really legalities. So, I mean, they are. You, you have um, legal responsibility to report. But again, this it comes down to every detail in the situation. And sometimes we're not really sure. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I learned in that class, which is the most helpful when you're dealing with um, any situation that can cause moral injury is he would say, consult, consult, consult. So every time we would ask him a question, we would say, well, what if this happens? You know, somebody's in our office and they're saying all this. And he would say, consult, consult, consult. And after a while, uh, you know, a few days in that class, he said, the reason I say it three times is because, you know, three times you're going to want to consult your top three people in this area. And after that, the more people you consult, it just starts getting messy after that. So just consult, consult, Mm. consult, and then make a decision like an adult and live with it. (laughs) Wow. And face the consequences of it. Wow. And so, and that's what social workers do all the time. I mean, they have to make very difficult decisions. Mm Mm-hmm. All of us consult all the time. And then, um, and this goes, you know, back into the work that we're doing and the work that the officers are doing often alongside of us. Um, We have to, you know, we consult as much as possible, but then at the end of the day, we have to make a decision and it's not always the right one. Mm -hmm. Um, I know we don't always make the right decision. And so I'm sure law enforcement feels the same way, Mm -hmm. Um, especially when it comes to these situations where there's not enough resources. Mm because. You're always going to feel like you didn't make the right decision when you're dealing with moral injury because that person actually does need help. Right. It's just not you. Right. So, um, and then sometimes it is. Sometimes there is more you could do. So we also talk about um, not nothing advocacy and what can you do that's not nothing. That does not mean, you know, if you're some random person coming out of the store and you see, you know, someone who's obviously homeless outside the store. That does not mean you have to do everything they ask or you should or you should give them your home or your money. That I think people get a little bit into the weeds with stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And when we're like, yeah, people really do need help. And they're like, well, then why don't you open your home to them? Mm-hmm. Us as individuals cannot solve these problems. Right. We have to do it as a society. We have to do it through the only means we have, which is usually taxes and yes, um, getting resources. Yes. So that's. I would rather the, those community members go down to the city council and say, do something. Right. Without trashing people, because just because you don't have the means to help someone does not mean that they're awful people and don't need help. Right. You know, don't go down there and say, do something and get rid of them, because that's you acting on your moral, moral injury and your inability to help. But, um, you know, just go down there and encourage them to do something. Whether because, they will or because not. Because it is in their power. I mean, yes. you know, I, I remember when that. Um, when that came in front of the city council, the neighborhood had signed this petition. There were like 29 signatures on yep, it or something they wanted that. to get rid of. And literally on the petition, it said they wanted to get rid of the homeless. It said remove 
The homeless, homeless from St. Timothy's. Timothy's. Yeah. Right, right. So, I mean, already the petition was in the weeds, right? right? I mean, and at the same time, I understand completely what they were trying to say was that they did not feel safe in their neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And and clearly, the city council didn't get it at all. They did not understand the problem because they didn't actually fix it. They came right. up with this ridiculous ordinance that, you know, limited the right. number of times lunch could be served, which is like, no, 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 no. <laughs> the problem is the people at night who happen to be living in Azalea Park, I mean, mm-hmm. not at St. Tim's, but, mm-hmm. in, you know. So it was like the the real issue never got dealt with, and it, and the only people who actually could have dealt with that in a in a real way were the city council. Mm-hmm. Have a shelter that that would have immediately. Mm-hmm. And you know what's interesting is there is there was well there was with the previous council there was some significant um, interest and push into um, finding a location. For people to be able to camp and safely, mm-hmm. um, you know, we would be able to safely provide services and and mm-hmm. keep them safe. Right. And uh, just that alone is enough to build some momentum to do mm-hmm. things with. It's enough to get the state to pay attention. It's enough yep. to get, I don't know about the county, but regionally it's enough to get attention. Um, and so I, I firmly think that the city council most often um, doesn't think that they're really affecting things a lot. They're just doing little things here and there, but they actually have m- way more power than they realize. And and I know that they don't realize it all the time because even in 2020, in December of 2020, when they were voting to uh, make it illegal to sleep in your vehicle, I don't know if you remember, but we... I, I th- want to say you were in the conversation with Jake. I feel like where I was. we were talking about yeah. it. Yeah, and um, and his response, and Jake, you know, he yeah, he was he was uh, kind of listening by that point. Yeah, um, and he himself said, "Well, it's not really going to make a difference. It's kind of already what they're doing." Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, that it does. It absolutely does. It it explain. It really pushes out to the entire community. Um what leadership feels about the issue. Right. And it pushes the energy in that direction. Yep. And so um, like like with Turnkey and that whole town hall, um, I was pretty upset afterward because we were told that yes, that the city the city was the one that requested that town hall. You know, we weren't we didn't have to do that. And And we know what the all the ulterior and we, motive was. I mean And we asked yeah. the only thing we asked was that it be safe for us to be at. And it was borderline mm-hmm. unsafe at a few right. points. I mean, I'm sure it would have been fine, but it was certainly emotionally toxic yes. um, for us that were up there and really it wasn't healthy for anybody mm-hmm. in there. But what I would have loved to have seen from that those city councilors that were present and two county commissioners mm-hmm. was I would have loved the, to have seen them take the mic and just say, you guys, I'm not weighing in either way. All I'm asking is that everybody be respectful right now so that we actually can hear what it is people are wanting. Yes. Because that coming from a leadership, um, you know, just anybody in a position of power, especially the city council, especially the county commissioners, it's going to do a lot to just forward the conversation. Because as I've mentioned before, we don't require community and city council and county government um, support to to have projects and have services. It just makes it a lot easier on those of us who are doing that legwork. Um, and it makes it less toxic. And, and it also helps quell that panic yep. that people have that are like, I have no power. And that's yep. that moral injury issue. Yep. They feel that they have no power. So when leadership stands in and says, hey, we all need to listen in here and just kind of keep it level, it allows everybody to get out of that panic. And it feels like everybody's going to be heard. And it's interesting because the the reality is that when somebody is elected to a position, they are elected to serve everyone. Now, it may not be everyone who voted for them. They are obligated to serve everyone. And they, they don't have to personally agree with everyone. Exactly. But it's important that everybody feel heard. Yes. It's important that everybody get a chance to speak. Yes. And yes. whether that's yelling because they're 
their moral injury level mm-hmm. is so high that they feel they're panicked and they really right. feel that they are not being heard. Or, I mean, and that's really a great opportunity for leadership to step in and say, like, we're going to, look, everybody can calm down because we're going to hear it all. Right. And, right. you know. And that's what actual leadership is. Mm-hmm. Actual, actual leadership. I know. Not, not standing up there beating your chest, but actually leading. And we've seen a little bit of that because, um, you know, especially getting towards the end of 2020, that is sort of the leadership that Jake was presenting to yes. people was, I am actually going to listen to every side. Yep. And everybody was calm, calmer around yes. Jake at that point because they all felt like they were being heard. Yes. And even if it didn't go anywhere more than it would have had he not listened, the, the fact that he was made us all kind of like, okay, you're not my enemy over there on that side because right. he's listening to both of us now. That's right. That's right. And I mean, we all, if you have, if you have kids, but if you've been a kid, I think you all have, um, <laughs> like that's all we wanted from our parents was just to hear our side of it too. Exactly. And when they didn't, we panicked and freaked out and that's yeah. when we punched our sibling or not. Yeah, exactly. Whatever, exactly. I don't know, whatever you guys did. But, but that's the reality yeah. is that we just want to be heard. Yeah. We want to be heard. And I think that's what, you know, probably the city council missed in terms of yeah. making an appointment rather than allowing the election to go through is that we wanted to be heard and now feel like we weren't. And and there is no amount of description. There's no amount of, um, it's not an excuse when they say like, oh, we really wanted a quorum. We really wanted this. We we wanted to make sure none of that matters. You weren't listening. And so we, uh, I think most of us feel that way Um, when they say like, well, you know, it's almost like a, well, surely you wouldn't have wanted this. Yes, we did. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what we wanted because the the other way that we were trying to go about it, nobody was listening to us. So yes, we right. we, we didn't want it that way, but you guys weren't listening to us to begin with. Right. So this was the only other option. And so so now they've just demonstrated they're not listening again. So it's like, so you're still not listening. Yeah. And... <laughs> And I like, it's so wild because I still have no idea what's going to happen exactly. I know. (laughs) um, I think Monday is the last day that people can apply. The 28th, I think. When when is the 28th? Oh, gosh. It might be. No, I'm pretty sure. I think it's Tuesday. Tuesday, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, because it started on the Monday? I can't remember. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. So anybody out there who has even thought about uh, being on the city council, you should definitely apply. Yeah, this would be a great time to apply. Yeah. It it seems like, um, I mean, everybody's fairly new. Mm-hmm. So honestly, I think that that could be a great experience yeah. for people is everybody yeah. kind of learning together. And Could be. Um, I, I'm hopeful about it. So, yeah, we're almost, well, we are definitely out of time. <laughs> huh. <laughs> so, Diana, thanks. We yeah. never got to politics, but we did kind of. So. <laughs> We'll talk about everything that next is week. politics. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks for showing up and thanks for everything you yeah. do in the community. I really appreciate it. And thank you for tuning in. Morality, ethics, and politics are critically linked and play a significant part in all of our lives. Representative government really depends on the voices of the people being governed. This is particularly true right now. I'm Candace Michelle, and this is our community.